Right, well, brothers and sisters, it's time to resume, and uh, we are now going to look at the two areas of particular uh, difficulty for us as preachers, and that is the area of application and the area of illustration. What I've got to say about application is on page 23. I'm not going to say all of that for the sake of time because I do want to include an extra amount of time on the whole issue of illustration. But just to look at page 23, you'll see that I think the two most common criticisms of expository preaching, and I had a man talk to me about it last night, was one, that expository preaching tends to be dull. It's like a running commentary on the text. And two, that expository preaching can be seen to be far too academic and not earthed in real life, not applied to real life. So I come away too often with the question, so what? And that so what question hasn't been answered. Now, they're the two most common criticisms of expository preaching. And the uh, answer to the issue of it being too academic is really an emphasis on application. And the answer of it being dull is an emphasis on engagement and illustration, which we're going to look at the second hour this morning. I'm not going to say much about what's on page 23 uh, for the sake of time, but I just take you over to page 24. On page 24, um, at the foot of the page, you have there uh, the bridge illustration of the text of the first century and the hearer and the issue that sometimes a text is fairly straightforward to apply. For example, love your neighbour as yourself. First century, this is how it will look. 20th century, this is how it will look. 21st century. Uh, however, sell all that you have and give to the poor. Uh, first century may look a particular way, but how are we going to apply that in the 21st century? It's a little more complex. Now, at the foot of your pyramid there, you will see that we work hard on application. And I take it, therefore, that, and again, I'm just emphasising that this is the way I work at application. Um, I ask myself, what are the unchangeables between the text in the ADBC and now? And the two unchangeables are, first of all, God in his character does not change, and people, outwardly may, we may change, but people at heart do not change. And so therefore I ask myself the question, what does this passage tell me about God? What does it tell me about people? Now other speakers can talk about what's called the human depravity factor. Um, how do I see in this text the human depravity factor? Or uh, others call it the fallen condition focus, the FCF or the HDF. Uh, the fallen condition focus, I just say us. What does it tell us about humankind? Because the text can tell us about our fallenness, <coughs> but it can also tell us about the ways we've been redeemed. So, for example, the text last night of Acts chapter 8, the Ethiopian eunuch, certainly tells us about us that we need to have the gospel uh, explained. We don't have natural insight into the gospel. The Ethiopian eunuch, I'm sure, was a, a, an honest man. After all, he was a treasurer. Um, you'd think he'd be honest. And he was an intelligent man. After all, he was a treasurer. I think that follows too. Um, and therefore, but he needed explanation. He needed insight. But the other thing it tells us there about us is that we are messengers. Philip was one of us. And therefore, he is a messenger. He is a biblical theologian of the gospel. So it doesn't tell us about necessarily about his fallen condition focus, but it tells it about us. Now, what does that text last night, uh, the Ethiopian eunuch and Philip, tell us about God? It tells us that God has a heart for the lost and he is the sovereign evangelist. He sets up into sections laid down in eternity. So it tells us about God as the evangelist, the outgoing one who has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. So I'm always asking myself the question, therefore, what does it teach me about God and what does it teach me about us, about people? Then I move to these three areas, and I'm sorry, uh, at the bottom of your pyramid, it's in the order of necessary, possible and impossible. I now do it in this order, necessary, impossible and possible. The necessary shows you must, how it must apply to all. The impossible shows you how it must not apply to any. And the possible shows you how it may apply to any. Now, with that emphasis, must not may, I go into work on application. How it must apply, how it must not apply, 
and how it may apply. And in, at this point, I'm very careful to not to take this and to press it into that. So by showing you how it may apply in my experience, I'm not saying this is how it must apply to you. Haddon Robinson in his book on preaching says that if heresy is going to be preached, it will probably be preached during application. Mm. And most often it will be preached by taking what may be an implication of the text and making it a legalistic requirement. And we must not take the possible and press it into the area of the necessary. Now, I think for me, the impossible application of the passage is particularly important because I take it whenever I'm preaching to a group of people, at least half of them are living consistently with the impossible application of the passage. Now, that's just from my pastoral experience. But I reckon whatever I'm saying, that half of them are living consistently with the impossible application of the passage. Now, therefore, if you take this morning's sermon on Acts chapter 15, that we are right with God through the work of Christ alone plus nothing, the opposite of that is, the impossible application of that is, that we are right with God through the work of Christ plus something. Now, you can't interpret that text to say that. And therefore, I think, do half of you live consistently with the impossible application of the passage? Now, I'm used to preaching to Bible college students, and you'd think that half of them wouldn't be living consistently with the impossible application of the passage, but I think we do, and at times I do. Now, therefore, work on the impossible application. I often think I understand more than necessary when I see the impossible. Let me give you an example of that. Take your Bibles and look up Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. Uh, the Sermon on the Mount, an interesting verse because Jesus starts it with a negative and ends with a negative. And no one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. That's in the context of doing your religious practice for public show. You cannot serve two masters. You'll hate the one, love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve the two masters, God and money. Now, therefore, that means that I can follow God and I can follow wealth and I can follow them along perfectly well until God says, I'm going this way and wealth says, I'm going that way. I can't go both ways. I'll either go with God or I'll go with wealth. I'll use wealth to serve God or I'll use God to serve wealth. I'll do one or the other. I can't do both. It's impossible for me to do both. Now, therefore, I would say the necessary application of that passage is this, that recognise you can't serve wealth and God, therefore serve God and use wealth in the service of God. All right? Now then, the impossible application of the passage is that I am the exception and I can serve both God and money. No one can, you cannot, I can. That's the opposite of what Jesus is teaching. And I reckon probably half the congregation are living consistently with that. Yes, I've got God, I've got him under control, and I've got the security in my wealth as well, and that's really good. I'm, I've got them both under control. And inevitably you will find that you'll start serving wealth and you'll use your faith in God in order to serve wealth. Now, it's good just to point out the impossible application of the passage. Now, let's go over to... Let's talk about an issue of... Um, application in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. I want to talk to you about sex. Now, uh, as I said last week, I, I preach a lot in Chinese churches and I next year I'm pastoring in a Chinese church and I said to one of the elders, next year I'd like to preach a few sermons on sex. And he said, oh, Chinese people don't talk about sex. I said, no, but there are a lot of Chinese people. Now, look at what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 18. He says, flee from sexual immorality. Now, just let's take it on that. Let's not worry about context at this point. Let's assume that I'm going to preach that. Remember that Corinth was one of those cities that didn't have a red light area. It was a red light area, right? All through. Flee from sexual immorality. Necessary application. Get away from sexual immorality, right? Get away from porneia. Sexual activity with anyone with whom you are not married. Get away from it. Someone said the only way to beat sexual temptation is with your hat, grab it and run. 
grab it, get out of there, get out of there. I was down in KL the other day with a group of students, we're walking down the street, and I was just walked back into one of the arcades and a woman came out and said, full body massage, full body massage, get out of there, get out of there. That's not the place for you to be, flee. Opposite, impossible understanding. Instead of fleeing, run to it, embrace it. Now you see, flee sexual immorality, get away from internet porn, get out of there or run to it, hardly wait to get to it. Now that's the impossible application. Now look at what the apostle says, flee sexual immorality. Now you could say, well, this is God says, the seventh command, you shall not commit adultery. What is the you shall equivalent of you shall not steal? You shall respect one another's goods. You shall not commit adultery. You will respect one another's bodies. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not lie. You shall respect one another's reputations. What God is saying here, therefore, what the Apostle Paul is saying is very respectful of marriage and honours the marriage bed, in the words of Hebrews. Free from sexual immorality, all other sins a man commits are outside his body, but he who sins sexually sins against his own body. So Paul is saying, flee from sexual immorality, and here is the theological foundation of doing it. The theological foundation of doing it is your doctrine of the body. That is that you are atta attaching your body to someone else's body and your body is a temple. Verse 19, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? So doctrine of your body, the Spirit dwells in you as his temple. Therefore, do not take that which is the temple of the Holy Spirit and join it to another in an inappropriate way. Second point of theology, look at what he says, you are not your own. You were bought at a price, therefore honour God with your body. You do not belong to you. Here's the basis for all Paul's thinking, isn't it? You do not belong to you. So in Egypt, the parents wake up the morning after the Passover. They go into the bedrooms of their firstborn sons and their firstborn sons are dead. There is great wailing. In Israel, the parents of Israel go into the bedrooms of their firstborn sons and their firstborn sons are living. On what basis are they living? That the blood of the Passover lamb has been applied to the doorposts and the, under the safety of the blood of the Passover lamb, God has purchased the firstborn of Israel. Now you remember what God says. They say, our sons are alive, thank Yahweh. And Yahweh says, yes, but they are no longer your sons. They are not yours. I have bought them. They are now mine. Now you see, on what basis do we claim the benefit of redemption but do not realise its implication? You do not belong to you. You have been purchased, bought by the blood of the Lord Jesus at the cross. So Paul can say, you, plural, are not your own. You were bought at a price, therefore your body is not yours to use any way you please. You use it in a way which honours your Redeemer. Now Paul, therefore, gives you the exhortation and he gives you the two theological reasons undergirding that exhortation. Number one, that your body is the temple of the Spirit. And number two, redemption, that you were bought at a price. Therefore, flee sexual immorality, because sexual immorality is, a, is, is using your body in a way which is antithetical to both those great truths. Now, therefore, I take it that when I come to applying this text, having expounded that text, and surely in our society, that text needs exposition. I therefore come to the necessary, impossible, and possible. And it's at this point that I'll get into trouble if I'm going to get into trouble. Now, whenever I'm preaching on a sensitive issue like sex, I like to think that if my mother were in the congregation, she would heartily approve of what I had to say, and she would ask for a CD to give to her great-grandchildren. There'd be nothing I would say in my sermon that would embarrass my mother, and therefore I'm not going to go into mechanical issues with regard to sexual practice, but I'm going to make it quite clear what I am talking about. Therefore, what does this passage tell me about God? First, it tells me that God's lordship is overarching and intrusive. It's an amazing thing, isn't it? 
that God is concerned with our sexuality. Why is the Muslim so offended that the Song of Songs is in the canon of scripture? Because they cannot imagine that Allah has any interest in our sexual activity, but Yahweh does. Yahweh tells his people where they are to go to the toilet. What's that got to do? His lordship is intrusive. Yahweh tells his people how to use their body in a sexual way, which is a way of glorifying him. It shows that his lordship is intrusive. He will have a people of purity, and that means purity of sexual practice. Now that's, sexuality, therefore, is important. It's not to be denied, but it is to be embraced. It can be abused, so use it in an appropriate way. Flee from sexual immorality. So it's like the old story, isn't it? You put petrol in your car and it will get you from A to B. You siphon some of that petrol out and throw it on a fire and it will erupt. That which is perfectly good in one environment to get you from A to B, taken out of that environment and placed into another is actually destructive. And sexual activity is like that. It has been created by God for one environment in which it is a wonderful gift from God. That is the environment of the marriage. Take it out of that environment and place it into any other and it becomes destructive. And that's why when Yahweh says, avoid, flee sexual immorality, it's for your good. So this tells us that God's lordship is for our good and it is intrusive. Secondly, it tells us about us that we have sexuality and it, is, it has for us a potential for good or it can be misused and therefore we are to avoid it outside of marriage because it is destructive. Now that leads me to the necessary, impossible and possible. Therefore, the necessary application is this for all of us. Recognising that my body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, recognising, secondly, that I have been redeemed by the blood of Christ and my body does not belong to me, I will flee from any semblance of sexual immorality, porneia, or sec inappropriate sexual indulgence. That's the necessary application. Your standards will be above reproach in thought and deed. Remember what Jesus said that adultery in the mind is adultery, in thought and deed. That must be the necessary application of the passage. Flee, get out of there, grab your hat and run. Do not compromise, don't hang around. Impossible application. Now I want to go to the impossible to see how this works out in the opposite way because that helps me with the necessary. As a Christian, I can play the field. I can flirt, I can test my sexual integrity to see how close to the edge I can go. It's impossible, isn't it? Don't fool around. It's like the young couple who might come and see you after church. In our courting, we don't quite know how far we can go. That is never the appropriate question. The appropriate question is, how can you build godliness in one another? That'll answer the question. Push the limit. You can sleep around in thought and deed. Don't do it. Don't compromise. Impossible. Well, it doesn't apply to me. I don't have to worry. You just be careful. So all that would be the impossible. What this must not mean to any. And yet how many of us buy the lie that we can quite happily go online and enjoy ourselves? Possible. Uh, how this may apply to any um, possible application. How does this work out for you? For example, uh, there was a student at our college um, who used to have an attachment to make his computer effective, and when his wife went to work in the morning, he gave her the attachment to take with her because he did not trust himself alone with the computer during the day at home. And whenever he was at home and she was at home, he would always set his computer up on the dining room table in the middle of the family room, and that's where he would access the net. He'd always do that. You say, well, that's very legalistic. It's not one bit legalistic. That man is making a proper assessment of his own condition. He's not laying that on you as a condition. He's saying, that's my standard. For me, watching television after 10 o'clock at night in Sydney, I will not do it alone. 
That's very testing if I'm watching test cricket from the United Kingdom, which is on at that time, but I won't do it because there's too much there that can waylay me and lead me astray. You say, you're legalistic. No, I'm not. This is a standard which I adhere to. I'm not laying it on anyone else. I was preaching on this at a church recently and one of my elders heard, uh, one of the elders where I go to church heard me say that, for example, when you go to the barber shop or the hairdresser's shop, in Australia there's lots of magazines to read there while you're waiting your turn in the barber's chair. None of those magazines are terribly worthy of you. Why not take a good Christian book? And I was walking down the arcade and I could see my elder in there with a sheet over him having his hair cut. And I waved to him and when he saw me, he waved and he pulled out the Tyndale commentary on the pastoral epistles and said, I've got it. <laughs> now, I'm not imposed. I'm just saying that if you don't have it, this is the wrong thing. I'm saying, well, that could be a, a helpful way of resisting temptation in this area. You work it out. At our college, for example, we make it quite clear to students that when they visit a faculty member in their office, the door will never be closed. The door will never be closed. And so if you go into a faculty member's office and the door is closed, you know something's wrong. The door will be open. And so help, hopefully that will keep us from any charges being made. So be very careful. Be very careful. Ravi Zacharias, when he travels to Australia, if he's away for more than two weeks, he will not travel without his wife. And if his wife is unable to be with him, he will always have a senior same-sex associate with him to protect his integrity. Billy Graham always had a rule. Now, there is a Christian leader whose integrity has never been questioned that whenever he would go to a strange city and to stay in a hotel in the night for the night, he would never go into the room first himself. He would always send an associate in to make sure the room was clear. Why? Because there could be a woman in there with a photographer and photograph Billy Graham, who's entirely innocent, in a compromising situation. You say, yeah, it's very pedantic, isn't it? He's overly careful. If you're going to maintain your integrity, you need to be overly careful. And I've seen too many pastors with young women put their arm around the young woman. Get your hands off her. Oh, she's young enough to be my daughter. All the same, get your hands off her. <laughs> I say to our students that there is one part of the human anatomy where it is safe to touch a person of the opposite sex. And sometimes you will need to touch a person of the opposite sex if they're sick or they're going through turmoil or dying or whatever. And it is between the elbow and the wrist. There. That's it. Nowhere else. That's the place. So you watch yourself and keep guard over yourself. Now what I'm saying, therefore, I'm taking applicatory issues, I'm talking about how this may work out in practice for you, but I'm not saying this is how it must work out in practice for you. So therefore, take the principles I'm talking about and apply them as you will to yourself. Now, therefore, under necessary, this is how it must apply, under impossible, this is how it must not apply. Under possible, this is how it may apply. Okay, application is vitally important because it is showing us how it applies. So last night, what was the application? God is the sovereign evangelist. He is the one whose heart is for the lost. Number two, Philip is the one who is sensitive to the divine intersections of life. Three, the Ethiopian is a debtor to grace. Do you see that you are a debtor to grace? Are you like Philip? Are you sensitive to the intersections of life? And do you start a conversation in any and every situation which may lead to Christ? And do you recognise that behind all things, God is the sovereign evangelist wanting to use you as the messenger? Now you take every sermon, therefore, and you say, this is what I'm learning about God. This is what I'm learning about me. This is how it must apply, must not apply. And this is how it may apply. Wives, be subject, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. Okay, men, dangerous ground. What are you going to say? It's very difficult. Now, there are two things as a visiting preacher that I will not preach on. And if a pastor asks me deliberately to preach on these, I say, no, you're a coward, you preach on it. <laughs> I will not preach on a woman's submission to her husband if I am not the pastor. I'll do it in my own church. And I will not preach on divorce because you are the pastor are best equipped, you know the situation in the congregation, you are the best equipped to preach on both those. What is interesting in Ephesians 5 is that where the Apostle Paul says, wives submit, he's using a compound verb in Greek. The verb is, listen to it, hupo tasso, preposition 
under, tasso is the verb, order yourself under. Wives, order yourself under your husband. The opposite of that is the verb anti-tasso. Preposition anti, tasso, order yourselves over. In James 4, 7, he uses both verbs in the same verse. Order yourself under God and resist, order yourself over the devil so that he will flee from you. Immediately I understand more about what submission means when I look at its opposite, and its opposite means resistance. So submission, therefore, is respectful of your husband's leadership. Resistance is the opposite of that respect, but resists your husband's leadership. That helps me when I'm looking for a way to understand submission if I can look at its opposite. It helps me when I, to see the necessary application if I can look at the opposite of the necessary application. Okay, I think I've said enough about application. Now, please feel free to ask a question about anything that may not be clear to you there. Asking a question is a great way of serving the group because it gives me an opportunity to be quiet too. So, any questions? Raj. How important? Yes. Well, I think go back to the passages. For example, where they are quoted, go back to the passages themselves. I'll give you an example of that. Um, if you look at uh, what Paul says about the human condition in Romans chapter 3, he, he finishes his summary of the human condition by saying, there is no fear of God before their eyes, which is a direct quote from Psalm 36. So I would go back there. That's Paul's way of referring to Psalm 36. So let's go back, I will say, and look at what Paul says in Psalm 36. In, fa hmm? in that top section, where does this occur in the Bible? What cross-references are there? Yeah, so in that top section, what, what does this say? It, what is the context in the book? What is the context in the Bible? So... It's very important because, it, depending on how the biblical writer uses it, that is very important. So that last night you could see that. Um, you can see it, for example, um, where Paul talks in Romans 4 about Abraham and David. It's driving you back to the experience of Abraham and David. So the writers themselves are making biblical theology core to what they're saying. So you need to as well. So context is vitally important and biblical theology is vitally important. But I'm not saying biblical theology is the be-all and end-all. And I think that maybe there are some who want me to say that, but I'm not saying that, that once you've taken the congregation to show them how you find Jesus in this text, you've done the work of application. That is not the case. And I think sometimes in Sydney, where biblical theology is so prominent, when we've taken people to Jesus, we think we've done the job. We've done the job partly. We need to keep pressing to do the job appropriately. Yes, I thought you might think that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yep, I agree. I agree. So we need to come. All we need to be aware of where we are in the whole process of progressive revelation. Yep. Yes. So sorry, Andrew was next. Sorry, Tim. Um, how do we help people not confuse the necessary and the possible? Because I can imagine sometimes preaching, and what I'm 
uh, talking about the possible, uh, people take away and say, oh, he's a... Yes, so you have to emphasise. Now, I'm not saying that this is the way it must apply to everyone. This is the way it must apply to everyone. But this is the way it may apply to you. I could imagine this applying to people here like this. But it may not apply to people here like that. This is a may, not a must, a may, not a must. But I'll tell you a must not. Uh, and, then, and then I think that um, underlining the must not is important because often I live consistently with the must not without knowing it. And so saying this is the way it must not apply. So that just came from church. I, I used to sit in, in our old church in front of three people who were elderly people and every week I'd turn around and I'd say, G'day, uh, what did you think of the sermon today? And invariably, they often heard the preacher say the, exactly the opposite of what I heard the preacher say. Now, either they're listening wrongly or I am. And therefore, I think uh, to hear... So if you're saved by grace through faith, yes, I know I'm saved by being good. So therefore, how do you shake a person out of that conviction by saying, if you are thinking right now that I am saying, that is an impossible way to understand this passage. That's how I'd say it. But I just underline may, may, may. And I think that's okay, but you're quite right, it is a danger that people are pl to put it into the area of the necessary. Tim? Yeah, just picking up on the, the comments of biblical theology from earlier. Of course, understanding that's integral to the way that we are preparing our sermons. Do you have um, either a system or a measure by which you decide how much of your working you are going to actually include in the sermon that you communicate? Yes, I think we include far too much, and therefore I want to summarise and not include everything in what I've got to say. Um, for example, if, if I'm in Romans 4, and, I, and Paul quotes from Psalm 32, uh, David's experience of justification. Uh, I might flip to that. That's one of the psalms that Luther calls Pauline psalms. Um, but I'll be careful that I don't go too often. I, I just think, as a communicator, every time I ask you to flip in the Bible, I've got to win your attention back. And I've seen the sort of preaching that's called biblical theological preaching and I don't think it's ever effective. And it's that sort of preaching which says we start in Genesis and we end up in Revelation and we're just flipping the whole time. And it doesn't give me any opportunity to settle down in this text. So therefore I try to limit myself to one or two flips, that's all. Come with me to so-and-so. Now today we actually flipped, I think, to Galatians because I think that is the necessary background to what Paul has to say. So I'm saying be careful of the number of times you flip because if you're flipping on a number of occasions, you're taking more text in and that needs to be explained. And I can be easily overwhelmed by that. Thank you. Yes, Judy. I can just imagine that if I've worked through this process, I've got, a, I've got not just an ankle sheet, I've got a poster-sized sheet yeah. full of stuff. Can you just spend a, a minute or two, useful stuff, helpful stuff, but good yeah. stuff. Yeah, and a lot of as, stuff. As Tim was saying, not, we don't want to show all our working in the talk that we give. Can yeah. you just spend a few minutes explaining how do I get that stuff yeah. into a helpful package? Uh, yeah, well, I've got a lot of stuff, and what you haven't seen yet is my commentary stuff. <laughs> so I've got all my stuff, right? I've got a few paper. Remember, I'm pencil and paper. So I've got it here, and then I go to my commentary, and I'm taking notes down because the commentary's always got great stuff too. And now that means I've got about 10 pages of stuff. Now I think, okay, so what happens? I think this is the scary bit. Okay, I'm praying, Heavenly Father, give me insight into this. I've now got to take these 10 pages and I've got to turn them into a manuscript. So I tell you what I do. I get up, I go over, I close the door of my office. Once the office door is closed, don't interrupt me. I put my phone on not to be disturbed. I get out my nice pad of paper and my very best fountain pens. <laughs> and I start to write. I know I've got to have an introduction, a body, and a conclusion. I therefore am thinking, what is my angle? How am I going to get in at this? Like this morning, the angle was Frank Jenner and the man who said, don't you know Deuteronomy says you shouldn't have a pierced eyelid? Right? That's the way in. 
and therefore I'm looking for the way in and then I'll explain because I've absorbed all this material and I'll say, what did he say? Put that together, put that together. And I just pray that that'll happen. And then I come to a conclusion and I want to make sure the conclusion is strong and succinct. So I think it's a very frustrating answer because I'm saying there's just that moment where it's all got to come together and I don't know how it does, but every week it does. <laughs> <laughs> but let me just say that uh, just on that, I think that it's important, and we've got to get on the illustration on that, but just on that, um, this is the way I see the sermon. Right, the sermon is like that. Right, now, I leave Sydney, I take off, and then I land in Kuala Lumpur and I'm on the jumbo jet. Now, the jet is full of people, it's full of fuel, it's full of food, and it's full of baggage. It needs maximum thrust to get it off the ground. Then over here, it's still got people, it's got food in a different form, it's got less fuel and it's got equal baggage. It needs maximum power to get it back on the ground. Now, the sermon, therefore, needs an introduction and a conclusion, and when it's up here, it sort of floats along. And that's the body of the sermon, which will give it structure, one, two, three, or whatever, depending how many movements. Now, in Sydney, I read an article in which people were asked at a typical evangelical church in Sydney, 10 minutes after the sermon, now this is very insightful, 10 minutes after the sermon, when they're at morning tea, questioners went out and asked each person, what do you remember of the pastor's sermon that was preached 15 minutes ago? And this is what they said. They remember the first thing, they remember the last thing, and they remember any mistakes that he'd made in the <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so try and eliminate mistakes because people do remember mistakes. They remember them very clearly. Make sure you get a good introduction and make sure you've got a strong conclusion. All right? Now, so, Judy, look, what I'm saying is I know I need an intro, that's my angle, I need a good way to finish off, and I need a structured body. And that's what I do. Now, I'm sorry, but that's about it. <laughs> that's all I can say. But that, that's why, to me, the work of the preacher is most like the work of the architect. That's why I love to look at architecture. Because an architect talks to his customers, he sees the land, he thinks about the need, and then he closes the doors. Having done his research, he sits down and there's that moment where he puts it all together. Now that is almost precisely, except on a spiritual plane, what I'm doing when I'm preparing a sermon. I've done my work, I've got my pyramid, I've got my questions, I've got my extra material, I sit down now and I write. And for me, writing is the process by which it all comes out. Now maybe for you it's just the keyboard, I don't know, that's great. But I write. So my sermon this morning, uh, here it is, it looks like this. That's what it looks like. Written out, good quality paper. I like good paper. Good fountain pen, nice and thick. And it circles and it's highlighted. It's a black fountain pen, a blue fountain pen, some red pen. And that's where I go. And I just go. Okay. Now, all right, let, let's move on. We're now going to talk about illustration. And you don't have an outline for this, so let me give you the outline of what I've got to say. I'm going to do a series of falls. So this is illustrative material. Um, first of all, why are illustrations helpful? Why are they helpful? And there will be four reasons each time. All right, now what are illustrations? J.C. Ryle, who is a master of clear preaching, said that every clear sermon must have anecdotes and illustrations. Um, Spurgeon called illustrations the windows of the sermon. Um, D.B. Knox, who was the principal of Moore College, where some of us trained, used to say that you never understand a truth until you can put it in another way. And an illustration, of course, is another way of putting the same truth, if it's a good illustration. If it's a bad illustration, it's just a story that doesn't mean anything, it's not connected to anything. Be careful of that, because that only leads to confusion. Why are illustrations helpful? Number one, because they add interest and give relief to both you, the preacher, and to the congregation. So you know the riddle, why did the Ethiopian go on his way rejoicing? Because Philip had finished preaching to him. 
<laughs> the sermon was over. <laughs> now, uh, honestly, you need to be adding interest and it gives relief to the congregation and to you, the preacher. That's why illustrations can be helpful. Number two, illustrations are helpful because they make the truth memorable. You remember a truth by the illustration of that truth. If the illustration is tied carefully to the truth, which it must be. So that's the second reason why illustrations are helpful. Number three, illustrations are helpful because they reduce fuzziness in you. They reduce fuzziness, which is double Z, F U double Z I N E double S. So you need to have a clear grasp of the truth if you're going to illustrate it. So if you're talking to a friend and say, oh, I need an illustration for Sunday's sermon, your friend will say, what do you need to illustrate? Tell me the truth you need to illustrate. You need to sit down and think, I need to illustrate this truth because it's very abstract. How do I illustrate it? What is the truth? Then I can see how to illustrate it. And fourthly, illustrations reveal the human side of you. And I don't think that's a bad thing. Uh, truth through personality is what Phillips Brooks said. Therefore, when I go to listen to a preacher, I'm not listening to a neuter person. I'm listening to a real person. And I want, therefore, to hear something about how this person interacts with the text of Scripture, how life works for this person. And an illustration can reveal the human side of you. Mind you, in Australia, if you ever come to Australia and preach, I'll tell you the unforgivable sin of preaching. And an Australian congregation will never forgive you. They'll never forgive you. If you come to Australia and you big note yourself, you start telling us about all your qualifications and start telling us about all your achievements, Australians will put you down like that and turn off their hearing aids, right? In Australia, we don't have the tall poppy syndrome in which we bring people down. We only bring people down who've put themselves up and we're great at bringing people down who put themselves up. So you come to Australia and you put yourself down and we will love you for it. I tell you, <laughs> Dale Ralph Davis, who's a wonderful preacher, came to our college recently from the United States. I was introducing him to the students. Tell us about your church, I said. When I came to my church five years ago, there were 200 members. Today, after labouring, there are 195 members. <laughs> we loved him. We loved him. If he said, today there's 10,000, we'd say, oh, go away. Go there. Give us a break. Don't, don't tell us your success stories. You know, I've got a double PhD. I'm fluent in Mandarin, Cantonese, French, German. I can speak English as well. Have you seen what I've written here? Oh, don't. Please don't don't. So they reveal the human side of you, but don't big note yourself. We have a faculty member who is a doctor and he uses lots of medical illustrations. And of course in Australia to be a doctor, there's no higher position than that. But it's interesting to me that every time he uses a medical illustration, he puts himself down. You'd think he was the worst doctor on two legs, <laughs> but he's always doing that. And he's doing it because he doesn't want you to think that he's putting himself up by telling you a doctor's illustration. So, be careful of that. So, four reasons why illustrations can be helpful. Now, let's talk about the dangers, because there are dangers in illustrating or telling stories, and there are four dangers. The first danger is that your illustration can be too good, so that it draws attention to itself. And I forget what it's illustrating, I'm just taken with it. Now, an illustration must be like John the Baptist. John the Baptist was never drawing attention to himself. He said, look at him. And an illustration must always be pointing away from itself to the truth. So if you sit there thinking, what is he illustrating again? It's not a good illustration. Make sure it's not too good so that I don't remember anything else. Some illustrations are so emotionally confronting that I cannot remember anything else. I think, oh, that's dreadful. And I'm thinking, oh, it's dreadful, dreadful, dreadful. And you've preached on and I'm not even listening to you. I'll tell you about an illustration that was too good in my experience. I heard it way back 40 years ago and I can still remember it. It was in the Moore College Chapel. I was in second year and the bloke was in third year and he was preaching his trial sermon. I saw him recently and I said, Gordon, I still remember your trial sermon in the Moore College Chapel. He immediately blushed and went red. 
I said, I'll tell you what I remember about it. You got up and you started your sermon like this. You said, I'm about to show you something which you've never seen before and which you will never see again. You peeled the banana and ate it. We'd never seen that banana before and we would never see that banana again. <laughs> I've got no idea what you were illustrating. He was very red at this point. And of course, when he's eating the banana, he's eating the banana, he's not preaching. He's got to eat this jolly thing now. It was an illustration that's too good. Now, number two, illustrations number two can be too many. You can just have an illustration after an illustration after an illustration, and you can tell a string of stories. And there's nothing so half-baked and superficial than a sermon that's just a string of stories. I'm being severely disrespected by your story because you are taking the word of God and allowing the word of God to be displaced by your story, as though your story is going to minister to me and not the word of God. So be careful of having too many. When I drive away from church on a Sunday morning and I've got my wife sitting in the car there, you know as the preacher what it's like. You're waiting for some comment on the sermon and there might be some stony silence. And invariably, if there is stony silence, my wife will say, you are illustrating too much, too much, telling too many stories. Get back to the text, get back to the text. Well, I'm thankful that she says this. I mightn't be thankful at the time, but I'm thankful that she says it. <laughs> Thirdly, illustrations can be inappropriate so that you throw them in because you're desperate. Oh, this is a heavy sermon. I've got five pages to preach. I'm already in page two and I haven't got one interesting thing to say. I'd better throw something in. And it's dreadful. And I've heard people throw jokes in. Never tell jokes. I'm not against humour, but I am against jokes because by their very nature, jokes are manipulative. They're saying, I'm dying up the front, please laugh. And so you throw an inappropriate story in, and it's inappropriate because it just draws attention, so it stands there, and I've got no idea what that means. Inappropriate. And fourthly, the danger of, of saying wrong things. So you start talking about things you know nothing about. And the problem there is, if you're talking about medical stories, there's going to be a nurse for sure in the congregation who knows you're wrong. And once you start talking about this, a doctor will know you're wrong. So if you want to use a medical illustration, go and talk to a doctor and quote him as your source so they can go and blame him for any mistakes you say. <laughs> but I tell you, at one time I was preaching, and this just shows you what people remember, I was preaching to a group on a Sunday night, and I preached at the start of my sermon about the AMWU, the Amalgamated Metal Workers Union in Australia. I finished the sermon, last hymn, went to the door of the church, so it's about 45 minutes later, and I saw an old bloke get up and he came straight for me at the door. He said, you got that wrong. I thought, what did I get wrong? He took me way back and he said, it's no longer the AMWU, it's the Amalgamated Workers and Shipwrights Union, it's the AMWSU. Now I ask you, what else did he hear of my sermon that night? Not a thing. He says, I'm going to get him on that. He's wrong on that. He's got his facts wrong on that. I'll go and get him. Okay, so get your facts right. Check and double check. Now, friends, be careful of the dangers. Some people say there are so many dangers involved that I won't do it. Don't not do it just because it's dangerous. But recognise the dangers and avoid the dangers. Um, in my experience of listening to Chinese preachers, they tell far too many stories, far too many. And it ends up being superficial in their dealing with the text. Be careful of telling too many stories. My experience of listening to Caucasian preachers in Sydney is they tell far too few stories. So it's like a lecture and it's dull and it's not engaging. You need to make sure that when you are telling a story, you tie it very close into the text. All right, now let's talk about the types of illustrations there are next. And I'm going to talk about four, four types of illustrations. The very best types of illustrations are the types you get out of the sermon illustration books. No, 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 that's not the case. <laughs> Avoid those sermon illustration books. Um, I'm sorry, I love, I love Evangel, but don't buy the illustration books, please. Um, the things, number one, the best type of illustration are the things that happen to you. They are the best, the things that happen to you. 
And you can tell them because you can tell them with imagination. Uh, I was preparing a sermon to preach here on my first Sunday. It was on Psalm 119, verse 96. Um, and Psalm 119, verse 96 says, To all perfection I see a limit, but your commands are boundless. Now, this is just giving you an example. When I say to students, things that happen to you are the things that are best, they say, nothing ever happens to us. I said, what do you mean nothing ever happens to you? I'm in my 60s, you're in your 20s, and you've reached a stage in life where nothing ever happens to you. If nothing ever happens to you, make something happen to you. <laughs> and I don't mean by that make something up. I'm not saying that, but make something happen. Psalm 119, verse 96, to all perfection I see a limit, but your commands are boundless. What's the exception to that? That something which is really good, 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 good inevitably will depreciate. Yes, a sunset's like that, a flower's like that, the face of a person is like that. It's good, 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 then it depreciates, depreciates, depreciates. To all perfection I see a limit, except one, your commands. They are always boundlessly perfect. Exception, wine. I know nothing about wine. Phone, Wine Society of New South Wales. Hello, Wine Society of New South Wales, Patrick speaking. I'm making something happen. I'm talking to this man. G'day, Patrick, my name's David. I'm preaching on a psalm. I am a Christian preacher. The verse I'm preaching on says, to all perfection on this earth I see a limit except God's word, which is always boundless. The one exception I can think, think of that is wine. Isn't the older wine gets, the better it gets, and it always gets better and better and better? And Patrick said, no. He said, that's not true. The universal problem with wine is the problem of corkage. We have not yet invented the perfect cork. And no matter how old the wine gets, there comes a time when air gets in through the cork and the wine is ruined. So that verse is quite true. To all perfection, even wine, I see a limit, but your commands are boundless. But I said, no, wait on. What about those shipwrecks off Sydney Harbour? And they bring up the shipwreck and find all the port and wine down there. The wine is universally undrinkable. Why? Because the seawater has got in, seeped in through the corkage, the cork. You see, make something happen. That's what I'm saying. So therefore, things that happen to you are the best things. Make it happen. Secondly, the second type of illustration, go for the experience of others. Read biography. It's terrific. I was reading this and that. Or a friend said to me, a friend said to me he'd been invited by Leighton Ford, Billy Graham's brother-in-law, to go to the United States to a training course. And on the last night of the training course, they were going to have dinner, 12 of them, with Billy Graham. My friend wanted to meet Billy Graham. He wanted to ask Billy Graham questions, but Billy Graham was at the other end of the table. So he waited till Billy Graham went out to the bathroom and he followed him into the bathroom and he waited at the basin and Dr Graham came to the basin and this man, Steve, said to Dr Graham, Dr Graham, it's such an honour to meet you. Could I ask you a question and have your permission to tell my friend your answer to the question? Well, what is the question, Steve? The question is, what are the really big lessons you've learned after a lifetime of ministry? Well, Steve, I've learned three things. Now, you see, are you interested to know what the three things are? No? Okay. Well, I won't tell you. <laughs> okay. I happen to be interested. It wasn't my experience. I'm not saying I was there asking Billy Graham. My friend Steve asked Billy Graham. And Steve told me the three big lessons that Billy Graham had learned from life. That's the experience of others. And it's automatically interesting, I think, to most audiences. But because you're not interested, I'm not going to tell you the three things. <laughs> Okay, a man comes into an English village. It's nine o'clock at night. He's got six companions. He goes into the pub. He says to the licensee in the pub, he says, could we just have some dinner, please? The licensee says, no, sorry, the kitchen is closed. Can't provide anything. Look, whatever's over, we'll have. No, sorry, can't help. They go through the village, come to the pub at the other end of the village, and they go in there and the man says, I know it's late, but can we have some dinner? Of course, we'll keep the kitchen open for you. Look, anything, if the chef, whatever's left over, will have, no, 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 the chef will stay here, choose whatever you like. At the end of the night, the bill came for their drinks and food to 180 pounds. The man paid 180 pounds and then wrote out a personal check for a tip of 10,000 pounds. 
He said, I give you this as our tip on one condition, that you go tomorrow morning to that owner of the pub at the other end of the village and tell him what has happened tonight, that you've got a £10,000 tip. See, it's a remarkable story, isn't it? <laughs> you've got to know who you're dealing with when you turn him away. That was Australia's wealthiest man, a man by the name of Kerry Packer, and that's what he did. Friends, you've got to know who you're dealing with. And in this case, you're not dealing with some entrepreneur worth some money. You're dealing with the Lord of life and death. You're dealing with the universal Lord, the Lord Jesus. So the experience of others. Secondly, number three, the third type of illustrative material is the unforgettable quote. And there are not too many of them. So make sure that when you quote, when you're writing your sermon, you are not writing an essay. You don't have to footnote things. But there are some quotes that are really good. Listen to this one by C.S. Lewis. I think it's a great quote. I'll give you a couple of C.S. Lewis quotes. You don't have a soul. See, that's confronting, isn't it? You don't have a soul. You have a body. You are a soul. It's great, isn't it? I am a soul. I don't have a soul. I have a body which is going to drop off. Now, I think that's a quote worth repeating. I'll tell you the quote that I repeat more often than any other quote in my gymnasium, and it is this. If Christianity is untrue, it is of nil importance. If, however, Christianity is true, it is of infinite importance. The only thing which Christianity cannot be is of moderate importance. Because if it's true, it's infinite important. If it's untrue, it's no importance. But it cannot be of moderate importance. And I reckon if I repeat that often enough, at some stage, the penny is going to drop with my friends in the gym. Think about it. Lord, help me to be the man my dog thinks I am. I like that quote. <laughs> I like the quote of C.T. Studd. Why did you leave all your estate in England to go to be a missionary in Africa, India and China? If Jesus Christ be God and died for me, then no sacrifice can be too great for me to make for him. Good quotes. And you'll often tell me who gave you those quotes. Fourthly, the fourth type of illustration is the illustration which is observation, based on observation. Do you know, and, 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 and primarily, observation of the text itself. Uh, look at the pictures which are contained in the text. I've already referred to those. So you're observing things. I love to observe life. Do you observe your own culture? Do you observe people? This morning as I sat out at Hawker, I love Hawker, it's just wonderful. And I saw this old dog and it ran from there to there. And I thought, I wonder what goes through a dog's brain which causes us to run from there to there. <laughs> Why does a dog run from there to there? Is there something in its brain that says, right, it's time to run from here to there? <laughs> and then all of a sudden, this old dog pricked up its ears and looked like this. And then it ran very quickly to something. I thought, what is that dog doing now? What is it running to? Do you ever think like that? Oh, I do. And so I looked at the fellow who was serving us, and he was watching the dog too. And I thought, what is he thinking about that dog and its activity? It's interesting, isn't it? What, what, what goes through your brain? Do you think about things like this? Observe things. What really annoys people? Why aren't these people out of their brain when they're queuing up in a queue of 20, uh, uh, 20 queues before a toll gate? And when they get through the toll gate, they pay one ring at 60, just enough to get through the toll gate, and then they sit at another traffic jam. <laughs> it's just amazing. And they're not rude to one another. And they come in and push in on each other. What is it about these Malaysians? Why isn't there a rebellion here against a government that allows such traffic snarls all the time? I don't know. That's amazing to me, but good on you. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Okay. All right. Now, I'll give you four hints. Hints. Four hints. I'm sorry. I should have brought my book.
But the first hint is to buy a book. That is, buy a record book. Buy a book that you can write your thoughts in. Buy a book that you can write your insights in. Buy a book that uh, reminds you of things that happened. So here I am at the Blue Mosque. I'm washing myself. I'm putting on my sort of big dress type thing to go into the Blue Mosque. I'm met by a very fine young man who is our guide. He has his copy of the Quran. It is in Arabic. He translates into English for us from the Arabic, the preamble. And it says, blessed be Allah, Lord of creation. Sorry, blessed be Allah, the gracious and the merciful, Lord of creation and the King of Judgment Day. So he's translating that for us in our group and talks to us. And someone says, with great respect, how do you know that Allah is gracious and merciful? He says, because he tells us in the Holy Quran. Oh, yes, with great respect, I know he tells us. But how do you know he is gracious and merciful? Oh, because he created us. But we are Christians. We don't recognise that he has created us. So how does that show his grace and mercy? I don't know. You see, we follow the Christian God. He also tells us in the Holy Bible that he is gracious and merciful, but he also shows us by the empty cross and empty tomb of his son. So he claims to be gracious and merciful, and he backs his claims with actions. That is very interesting. Could I have your email address? and we could keep talking about this. Now, do you not think that that is a conversation worth recording? It is a good conversation, isn't it? And that goes into my sermon illustration book. It's not offensive to anyone. Everything is said with great respect. But it is a good question. How do we know that God is gracious and merciful? Buy a book and record things in the book and you'll find that your book will fill up very quickly. When I was in London recently, Dame Cicely Saunders died, and Dame Cicely Saunders was the founder of the hospice movement. A hospice is a place where a person goes to die in their last days. Dame Cicely said, the dying have three needs. One, talk to me. Two, don't leave me. Three, hold me. Hold me, talk to me, don't leave me. That's very helpful for me to know as I pass to people through the valley of the shadow of death. I will not leave you. I will keep talking to you. I will hold you. I'm here. Dame Cicely Saunders in her obituary in the Daily Telegraph in London. So buy a book and record it there. If you're a preacher, your interests are wide ranging. There is nothing that you're not interested in and you are constantly accumulating because you know that anything has the potential to be interesting. Secondly, the second hint, when you get an illustration, use it well. You can only, if you're in the same congregation every week, use an illustration once. If you repeat it a month later, they'll say, oh, he's getting old, isn't it? He's telling people things he's already told us, just shows you he's getting beyond it. So you can't repeat yourself, so use it well. If you use it at the start of the sermon, refer back to it. Keep reminding me of it and keep reminding me of the truth that it is explaining. A friend of mine says that when he preaches, he does this. He states the truth of the text, he explains the truth of the text, he then illustrates the truth of the text, and he says an illustration is worth a whole page of a manuscript because it often explains and drives home the explanation and then he applies the truth of the text. State, explain, illustrate, apply. So that's the way ahead for him. So make sure you use your illustrations well. Thirdly, uh, make sure you get a good catalogue of subjects in your book when you're writing down things that happen. My book is one which is broken up alphabetically. It's got one of those finger alphabet indexes in it. And so I've got to think about when this book is full, how am I going to find anything easily? And so I want to get the key word of the illustration and underline that. So assurance, 
A, assurance, alcohol, A, alcohol, whatever it is, and I underline that. And I make sure that I've got a clear outline of the cataloguing of my subjects. And the fourth thing, I think, is be personal. It's terrific to be, imper to be personal. Um, sometimes the sermon illustration books down there might have a helpful insight for you, or a Google illustration of something might be a helpful thing. But if you can be personal, I think that just adds to the moment and that is very helpful for you. For example, I had a student one time come into my office in the days in which I used to um, interview every new student who came to college. And this man came in and he sat there. He was very nervous. My office was a big office and I'm a tall man and he just felt very nervous and I couldn't get anything more than a grunt response out of him and mm, yes, yes, no, that was it. And then I said, do you have a doctor's medical certificate showing that you are healthy enough to study? And he pulled out his diary and he's flipping through his diary looking for his medical certificate. And as he's flipping through his diary, I saw that there was a purple show sash there. I said, oh, tell me, what was the show sash for? And he unraveled the purple show sash and it said, Sydney Royal Easter Show 1996, Champion Duck. I said, you bred the champion duck of the Sydney show. He said, I did. I said, what makes a champion duck? Well, here was this man, I couldn't get a word out of him. I now couldn't shut him up. He told me what makes a champion duck and duck, duck, duck. When he, when he finally came to college, he got nick Australians and great givers of nicknames and his nickname became the duck man. <laughs> but he knew all about what made a champion duck, basically about the bill and about the web feet. And you see, that's what makes a champion duck. What makes a champion marriage? What makes a champion life? Let's look at it today. What makes a champion marriage? See, it's a way in. Things that happen to you are the very best things. Listen to this brilliant one by Haddon Robinson. And see, just listen to the creativity of this. He's in New York underground. He gets off the station. The train pulls out and he looks up and someone has written in graffiti, I love grills, G-R-I-L-S. I love grills. The next day, when he gets off the train, he looks up and someone has put a cross through the grills and written, girls, stupid. <laughs> I love grills, I love girls, stupid. The next day he gets off the train, he looks up and sees what's happened now. And the latest graffiti entry is, well then what about us grills? Who loves us? You see, so I love grills, crossed out, I love girls, stupid. Who loves the grills? And Haddon says, who loved the grills? The grills are always the bridesmaid, never the bride. The grill is always trying to get into the social ring, but never quite can make it. The grills is always on the fringe of things. Who loves the grills? God so loved the grills that he gave... Now, isn't that very clever? <laughs> he's actually... He's saying, I've got no idea what a grill is. And he's just defined a grill for me and given me insight into what a grill is. It's, I think that's very clever. That's very brilliant. So I said to Haddon Robinson, where did, did, that, did that actually happen? He said, well... He said, yes, it did happen, actually. That happened. But many of the stories I get before I go on vacation with Bonnie is I go to a, uh, an old bookseller and he gives me old Reader's Digests and I take away Reader's Digests from the 40s and 50s and I read those stories and they're very helpful to me. So there you go. I, there's a secret from Haddon Robinson. Read the old Reader's Digest. But that one, I Love Grills, actually happened. That's a great one. Well, there you go. You're always on the lookout. I'm always looking for a story. And anything you tell me is potentially interesting and it's potentially something I can pass on. Mind you, if you are my parishioner uh, and you tell me a problem, that is off limits to anyone and you don't become a sermon illustration. You know that uh, cartoon in Christian leadership where the secretary buzzes the pastor and says, oh, pastor, your next appointment and last Sunday sermon illustration is here to see you. <laughs> and that, that, will ruin, that will ruin your pastoral ministry. And, uh, and if, you, if you say, well, in my last parish, that will put people off too because in your next parish, this will be their last parish and they'll become a sermon illustration. So do be careful of that. All right, so that's what I have to say about sermon illustrations. Now, 
question and answer time, question comment time. Do you have anything you'd like to say about this? Why is it helpful? What are the dangers? What are the types? And there are some hints. When to illustrate first? Uh, that's a very good question. Thank you for asking that. When should I illustrate? Illustrate from the very beginning. If you look at your introduction, your introduction should be illustrative of something. It should tell a story. And so illustrate by showing here's the big question and this is why it's a relevant big question for you to hear. Uh, so tonight, what I, what's my opening illustration? Uh, my wife and I recently decided that because we are now at home alone without children, we want to make sure that we don't spend all our time watching television. We determined that we would only watch television on two nights a week. Therefore, we decided which two nights are we going to watch? Well, what do you like to watch? I said, well, let's make it clear from the very beginning that in these two nights, we're not including anything cricket or football. That's exempt, isn't it? That's two <laughs> nights over and above the cricket and football. Right, and then we decided what we'd like to watch. So, you're automatic, I'm telling you something about ourselves how we made the selection of which two nights, etc. So that's personal, and it could be engaging, and it tells you about me that I'm thoroughly inconsistent, that I like watching sport. All right, now, so away you go. You start off with the illustration. I think that's important. Now, any questions? Yes. Okay, so the question is, I need to repeat the question, Noel. Uh, the question is, um, I emphasised the other morning, yesterday morning, the need to read systematic theology. And if I'm explaining uh, a term like justification, would I illustrate that term? And if so, how? Yes, I certainly would. Um, I'd try, you see, the aerial illustration today of the man with the flowers really is an illustration of justification. No matter what sort of a day he had yesterday or today, he's still in perfect relationship because he's clothed in the righteousness of Christ. And so you will always be striving um, for that. Uh, when Gresham Machen, the founder of Westminster Seminary, was dying, the last telegram which he sent was to his friend John Murray, who was the New Testament scholar at Westminster. And he said, without the active obedience of Christ, no hope. Now that is a terrific closing illustration. No hope without the active obedience of Christ. And I noticed there was a book up there by Brian Vickers in which one of the chapter headings is without the active obedience of Christ, no hope, in which he quotes that telegram of Gresham Machen. And Gresham Machen is saying that the foundation of my justification, that is the credited righteousness of God, what does Christ, what does God impute to me? He imputes to me the perfect obedience of Christ. And therefore, he sees me as clothed in the perfect obedience of Christ, his active obedience. Without that, there is no hope. So I'm always on the lookout for that. For example, I'll give you an example of that. Recently at our college, we had a fellow come who'd been a missionary in Japan. And he was explaining how in Japan, uh, it is difficult to communicate theological concepts in a language that doesn't have terms for Christian theological concepts. And someone asked him, what about the issue of justification? And he, look, no disrespect to the Japanese, but this is sort of what it looked like. He said, in Japanese, this is the word gi. Now, I think in Chinese, it looks something like this as well. It's a character above the line and a character below the line. The character above the line means literally lamb, and the character below the line means I, myself. So we take this Japanese term and we explain that justification is God looking down from heaven, but he can't see me because I'm hidden under the lamb himself. Mm. Now, I think that's a very good way of illustrating justification, that when God looks on us, he sees us covered or clothed by the perfect righteousness of his son. Now, very often when you go to Grudem or Raymond or Erickson or any of these uh, systematic theologians, they themselves, in explaining the truth, will often give you, it might just be a passing comment, and you think, I can take that up in an illustrative way. That's why I think it's important to keep reading that. So yesterday, um, that book by Vickers on imputation, I got that. And I think it's going to be full of material that will help me understand justification more and potentially illustrative. My view is that there is no truth in the Christian faith more vital than the truth of justification. In my gym sometimes, if there's no conversation, the owner of the gym will say to me, David, 
are you preaching on the weekend? I said, I am, Greg. Give us the sermon. Now, there's no better opportunity, isn't it? No matter what I'm preaching on the weekend, I give them a sermon on justification every time because that's the truth they need to understand. Anyway, so that, that's a very good question, but keep at it and keep thinking. Yes, someone else. Yes. Um, you mentioned earlier when looking at the dangers about telling jokes as opposed to humour. You took quite a strong line on jokes and you said, but humour where appropriate. Could you just expand on that a little bit? I just think the nature of a joke is that it's manipulative. Mm. It's an unreal situation. Mm. And why are you telling me a joke? Mm. You know, there was a, uh, an Englishman, an Australian and a Scotsman going down a road. I mean, it, it didn't happen. <laughs> uh, and I just think it's manipulative. I, so, I, but I'm not against telling me something that is humorous that happened to you or to someone else, if it illustrates the point. I just think the genre of the joke mm. is not appropriate in the context of the sermon. Mm. And I think we've got to be careful of telling too many funny stories, mm. because that may not be appropriate compared to the weightiness of what we actually have to happen. Mm. Is that okay? I can't think of a joke to tell you, but, <laughs> but you know what I mean by jokes. Yeah. Okay, someone else. One last question. We have time before we have sum up issues. Anything else? Yes. What are the three things that Billy Graham said? Ah, <laughs> I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> you weren't responsive enough. Right. I'm not forgiving. Yes, there was another hand up here. <laughs> was there another hand here that came up? Same question. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. Anything else? That's it? <laughs> Young man, I can tell you three things that I have neglected. I have neglected my Bible, I have neglected my prayers, and I have neglected my family. And I thank God for his mercy and grace in my life. But family, uh, prayers and Bible are my three neglects. There you go. So it's good, isn't it? Um, don't neglect your Bible, don't neglect your prayers, and don't neglect your wife and children. I think they're three great lessons for us all. Okay, Andrew, thank you. Thanks, David. Can I get you please to turn uh, to page 31 of your handouts? And then when you get to page 31, turn over one more page. And there you'll see a feedback form. If you wouldn't mind, can I just get you to spend a couple of minutes uh, filling out that form? We'll do it together now.